my intention today is to give you a bit of information about the research that I've done so far and about conserving pollinators in your garden or your allotment. My area of um, research is focused on uh, pollinator conservation in the urban environment. Um, my intention today is not to give you a list of plants that conserve pollinators because those lists are already really widely available. They're really, really good. They can be quite variable depending on what sort of species they're looking at, whether it's bees or butterflies, but there's loads of lists out there. So I'm not gonna just give you a, a list of plants. These are our pollinators. We've got our single honeybee, which I'm sure you're all fairly familiar with. Um, we've got about 24, between 24 and 26, depending on the year, species of bumblebees. Um, and then we have nearly 2,500 species of solitary bee. And many of these species, they vary between 3 and 15 millimetres. Some of them just look like flies, other look, look like flying ants. So it can be quite difficult to recognise them in the garden. But I'll show you a few different pictures of some of the species. They're quite variable, but hopefully give you a chance to um, recognise them and maybe later on if you see them in your garden you know what they are. Many species of butterfly moth, we've got about 20 species of butterfly which frequent gardens um, and those are the 20 species that I'm going to focus on today. Um, many, many species of moth. We've also got um, a lot of flower pollinating um, beetles and um, many species of hoverfly. Um, so bees are probably our most, well, they are our most important pollinator. They can pollinate a range of different flower shapes and types. Um, if you imagine the honeybee to be sort of the most, the, the standard pollinator, the standard bee pollinator, they tend to go for flowers which are like daisies, they're quite open, they're easy to access the pollen and the nectar inside. Um, bumblebees are bigger, they're sort of rotund, um, stronger insects, so they comprise apart the lips of larger flowers. They also have, this is a garden bumblebee, its, its tongue is extremely long, much longer than honeybees. So it can pollinate plants which have long corollas like this, bellflower. So they can, bumblebees can pollinate a much wider variety of different species of plant. Uh, solitary bees, because they vary quite dramatically in size, they'll also pollinate a slightly different array of plants. But I'm going to go through later and show you which sorts of plants they prefer and which sort of flower shapes they prefer. So when we talk about conserving pollinators in general, not just in your garden, we need to consider what resources the pollinators they actually need. And this varies depending on the species. Now here I'm focusing on butterflies and bees just because the types of conservation practice we apply to help these species will also help many of the other pollinators we just saw. So for but butterflies, the two most important aspects are the host plant, which is what the butterfly will lay its eggs on and which the caterpillar will consume. This is the most important resource the butterflies need. If you want butterflies in or around your garden, it's really important to have the host plant in the vicinity because they don't, they don't normally travel very far for a nectar resource. Most of the adult uh, lifetime is spent looking for a mate, so many butterflies don't actually visit flowers at all, so that's why you might see them in your garden but never actually see them land. Um, but when they do want to sort of quench their first, they're looking for nectar-rich species, and we're going to have a look at some of those. So bees, they're looking for quite a few more um, extra resources. Nectar and pollen in the plants that they visit, and we put we lump these together and we call these the floral resource and i'll talk about that again in a minute um, they're also looking for a nest site and nesting materials now this is not so applicable to the honeybee because we provide that for them but for um, solitary bees for instance they'll be picking up the, the, they'll either cut pieces of, of leaf or they'll um, they'll collect um, sort of mud or sand and they'll pack these together into their into their nesting pods um, bumblebees will be looking for disused burrows, that's where they mostly, um, th th those are the sites that they go for to, um, to lay their brood. Um, so if we look at all of these resources together, what we try to do in non-urban environments is create a habitat that contains all of these and put them together. And that allows us to conserve these species, not just in a single, maybe the adult stage of their lifetime by providing flowers, but providing everything they need throughout their whole life cycle. So I'm going to go through each of these and show you how this is applicable to your garden or your allotment. So nesting resources for bees. 
I'm going to focus on solitary bees for this one because um, they're, the, they're the lesser known bee. So they, there, are there are many different species of solitary bee and each one is looking for something slightly different to put their nest. This is, what, this is a cross section of a nest. So the solitary bee will crawl inside, it will lay, it will lay an egg and it will, have a, it will have a breeding pod and it will lay many eggs. And the, the substance in between, in this case it's, it's mud or some sort of um, earth substrate in which it packs together. And inside there also are provision of pollen and nectar substrate all mulched up ready for the larvae to consume when it, when it hatches. The, um, the leaf cutter bee, instead of using, this is probably a leaf cutter bee pod here, these are a different species, but you can see the green where they've cut up leaves um, and you might recognise that, that shape in maybe some of your rose bushes and, and that's absolutely fine, they're not doing any harm to the plant, that's, that's a solitary, that's a leaf cutter bee, um, mulching up the leaves and um, packing it in for its brood. Um, there's another solitary bee, this is, um, this is a Wolcada bee and it looks a bit like a wasp but if you ever see something that looks like a cross between a wasp and a bee it's probably a Wolcada bee and the plant that they absolutely love and this is one plant I can tell you that will encourage these is lamb's ears and they are great for the pollen and the nectar but what this bee is doing, this is a female she sit there, if you've seen lamb, lamb's ears, they have sort of a, a downy fur on, on the stems and on the leaves and she'll sit and she'll scratch up until she's got a ball and then she will use that to package up her, um, her nest. Um, that's what a bumblebee nest looks like if, if you haven't seen one. It's, um, you're more likely to uncover something like that so sort of towards the end of the year. Um, but they're looking, as I said before, for disused burrows. That's why they quite often say if you're trying to make a, if you use a pot or whether you buy a bumblebee box, if you're trying to make a, a bumblebee nest box from scratch, that's why they say put sort of, put materials in there, whether it's sort of hay, we don't normally um, suggest shavings, but if you've come across any bird nests or, or disused um, rodent burrows that you've uncovered when you're, when you're doing your gardening, save the material and, and, and use it inside. You can take a you can take a flower pot, turn it upside down, put the material inside and submerge it half into the earth and then if you get a length of hose pipe and trail it from the inside of the pot out to the surface so that it's flat against the surface of the soil, that would be an ideal bumblebee home and that's a really cheap and easy way to do it. Um, and if you monitor them um, through the spring, so the first bumblebee queens will be coming out this month, um, buff-tailed and white-tailed bumblebees are coming out this month, so they'll be looking for nest sites like that, so you can easily set those up and ready for the queens. Um, you'll, these, um, these nesting structures, these are solitary bee houses, these are different from a bug stack, which is what you'd expect to see, maybe if you've seen the pallets being stacked on top of each other, this is a bug stack, so it's, the intention is to keep it moist for all the creepy crawlies inside. A solitary bee house should be in full sun and should be put in a place where it's going to dry out quickly because they need to keep the brood dry inside. I would say about solitary bee houses is that this... Um, this picture was taken of a, of a bee house where there's a plank, a, a piece of flat wood that has been placed over the other side and they've just removed it so you can see what's inside. You may see solitary bee houses that are either made out of glass or plastic and it's almost like a test tube um, and this is for a visual educational purpose so you can see what's happening inside or you may just have some plexiglass over the front of that. There are some issues with this design because the glass and the plastic they tend to heat up quite quickly and so you can get moulds growing inside the brood. Oh this is just to, this is just to illustrate that you can use all different types of wood. You can use wooden blocks or you can use bamboo canes or hogweed or sunflower canes, it doesn't matter and the, the holes don't necessarily need to be perfectly perfectly circular but you need to, if you want to try and make one of these yourself, they're, they're really good because you can have a go at lots of different designs and pick whichever one you like. Um, but the holes have to be um, deep enough so that you don't have a strong um, temperature gradient inside because if it's too warm you'll get a sex skewed ratio of the offspring being all male and you don't want it to be too warm, you want a mix of, of males and females. Um, I do have, if anybody is interested in making um, a solitary bee house, I do have 
measurements. But it might be somewhere in the presentation. I can't remember now. Uh, but I do have the measurements if anybody would like to know. There has been um, a few pieces of research been done on this. And there are um, measurements which um, have been shown to encourage the most number of occupancy rates in, the, in, in these nests. Um, so for butterflies, um, butterflies are are a bit tricky with wildlife gardening because many of the species they have they are um, they are specialists which means that there is only one plant that they'll lay their lay their eggs on only one plant that the caterpillar will eat um, normally with the floral resource in terms of collecting nectar they're not so fussy but the most important thing is the host plant so there are about 60 there are 60 um, species of butterfly in Britain um, about 20 of those you might see in your gardens. So to encourage butterflies in your gardens, it's probably best to just have a look at the context of your garden or your allotment and just think about what you actually have in there. If you, if you, ha if you have an allotment or a garden that's filled with stinging, or you have stinging nettles everywhere or thistles, then your best bet is to try and encourage finessed butterflies, which is your really iconic British species, your red admiral, your peacock, um, your comma, um, and and these are the species which you would quite often see um, feasting on Buddleia in the middle or the middle towards the end of the summer. Um, if you have, if maybe your garden is near agricultural land and you've got lots of grass species um, and the grasses can grow so that you've got the fluorescence on top, so you've got the flowers on top if they're allowed to grow long or if you have a mini meadow in your garden, your best bet is to, you might see um, the brown species, so your meadow brown, your ringlet, those sorts of species. Um, the, the blue butterflies are rarer to see in gardens. These are the species that tend to be the most specialist. So, for example, um, Adonis blue butterflies, they only lay their eggs on birds for trefoil. So, but you can, you can try and encourage them in your gardens. It's a little bit harder than trying to encourage bees that are gen more generalistic. Um, but you can have a go. There's um, some blue butterflies, as I say, only on birds with trefoil. Some of them are only on sorrel, so common sorrel or sheep sorrel. And some of them only on holly or only on ivy. So they're a lot more particular. So if you do see a blue butterfly in your garden, have a quick look around, see what you have, see where it might be landing. And especially look out for the caterpillars as well. Um, the, I'm going to give you an example of, of white butterfly conservation in a minute. But uh, white butterflies... They quite often found on um, out, uh, outdoor purging buckthorn. Otherwise, you can garden for them quite easily by growing vegetables. Now, I'm, I'm pretty useless in this respect because if I grow a vegetable garden and I see a caterpillar on one of my cabbages, I think, well, you probably need it more than I do, so I just let them get on with it. By the end of the season, I don't actually have anything to show for a vegetable patch. But if you have a space in your garden, you want to do something a little bit different with it, I realise this probably doesn't apply to um, many people who have allotments who are using it for, for a product at the end. Um, but it's a bit unusual. So you don't have to have a cabbage. So you garlic mustard, there's other species. That I'll, um, sh I'll show you a bit more um, in a minute. But there are other species that you can, unusual ones that you can put into your garden that might be utilised as a host plant. And it's really important to make sure you have enough of them. So butterflies are... They're, they're very difficult to conserve because when they're picking a site to, to lay their eggs, there might be, there might be um, 10 metres of stinging nettles all in a row, but only one of those leaves on one plant may be in the exact right positioning in the sun and the it, so it, for them to lay their eggs. So it's, it's quite tricky um, to, to conserve butterflies. But if you see them, then it's, it's a good idea just to have a think about what it is in your garden that they, they might be using if you see caterpillars then maybe just leave a few nettles in the back of your uh, back of your if you've got your garden to to stand okay uh, but there are there are alternatives if you don't like the sort of wild um long grass thistle nettle look there are alternatives holly buckthorn um so if you think about floral resources in three different aspects um the first is that there's pollen and nectar in flowers, which is really important for pollinators, but that's just one aspect. And within the pollen and nectar, there are lots of different nutrients which these pollinators need to, to, uh, to improve their health and um, maintain a resistance to, to diseases. Um, but there's also the consideration of gene flow. 
Now, to maintain a healthy population of any species, there needs to be a high genetic diversity, which means that they can adapt to changes in their environment. Now, if, if all of the habitats are isolated, if you have pockets, and say there's, that there's a pocket of agricultural area, a pocket of urban green space, then the likelihood that a pollinator is going to travel from one all the way to the other with no stops in between is very unlikely. So to encourage the spread of pollinators all through the urban environment and other environments, we need to create these species-rich plots in our gardens and on our allotments to encourage a movement across the entire landscape. So in a very broad sense, that's why the floral resource is important. And if you wanted to take that down to garden level, you could say, you, you could have a look in your neighbour's garden, and if they have a particular species of poppy or whatever it happens to be, you might consider planting the same thing in your garden so that there's a continuous strip. Because some pollinators, they don't want to, they don't want to visit lots of different plants. They actually like a mass of one species. So for bees, then, um, spring plants that are in flower now or, or this month and next month are as important, if not more important, than this, all the species which flower during the summer. So I've put a few examples there, but you're looking at accommodating queen bees that are coming out of hibernation. And these queens are setting up their nests um, and the, um, you'll have... Um, you'll have quite a lot of mining bees come out at this time. As I said before, buff and white tail, this is a white tail bumblebee queen, they're coming out this month and the first solitary bees will emerge next month. So it's really important to have something in your garden. The very best thing is to have, um, is to have blossoming, spring blossoming uh, fruit trees. So you've got your apple, cherry, plum, pear. Um, and a really popular species is, is willows, so salix species. Um, so this, allows, this gives them the opportunity to collect lots of pollen and nectar and, to, and, and, uh, and uh, provision that for their brood when they start, when they start to have um, baby bees. So in the, in the summer, these are probably the, the species that you're much more familiar with planting. These species are ones that they're either wildflowers that you can plant, that you can grow from seed or they're plants that you can get from the garden centre. It doesn't really make much of a difference. Um, if you can, if you've got a flower which is which is quite open, um, so say a, a daisy or a, a, a clover or whatever it happens to be, it's always a good sign. If you're at a garden centre, it's always a good sign if you can actually see um, pollen and nectar on the plant. If you if you can see sort of a dusting, so here the dusting is actually coming off on the bees. If you can see that on the plant, you know it's pretty much going to be almost definitely useful to at least one pollinating species. Um, okay. It's a bit more tricky with plants like um, foxglove where you can't actually see inside. Um, but as a general rule, open flowers are good for pollinators. Um, and I'll come back, to, come back to flower shape in a minute. So to give you some examples from some solitary bees, um, as I said before, they're very variable. And you've got um, most solitary bees are generalists, like all bees. Some of them have specific plants that they look for either to either as um, a nesting resource as well as a pollen and nectar resource, or just because that particular plant is available at the time of year that they emerge. So, for example, this is the ivy mining bee. This is probably the last solitary bee that you will have seen in, the, in your garden at the very end of the year. It looks like a wasp, but it will only feed on ivy. That's the only place you're going to see it. Um, the uh, lamb's ear, the wool carder bee, as I said before, looks a bit like a wasp. Um, but, but as you see, these are, these are the more specialist species. So if you wanted, if you wanted to encourage scissor bees, then plants lots of, lots of daisy species. But those are the slightly more specific ones. So this is, this is sort of a plant list, but not really. It's, um, there has been, there, there are so many lists documenting all, that have, all of the different plants that are good for butterflies. Um, what I've done here is um, put, to, put together a, two reviews that two different um, academic researchers did. And they, they tallied the number of but British butterflies that utilise each of these plants as a nectar resource. So although butterflies don't often 
feed on flower, uh, don't, don't often feed on nectar. If they do, these are the plants they're going to go for. Um, so the thistles, 47 species of butterfly, utilise these for their nectar. Um, and going down the list. But you'll probably notice that some of those are quite wild species. You wouldn't really want them in your garden. Um, perhaps slightly different with your allotment, but a lot of people I know wouldn't like thistles or even brambles in their garden. Um, but there are species there which, are, which look really, really attractive in gardens. Things like wild oregano, knapweed, um, birds for trefoil, perhaps not ragwort if you live near agricultural land. Um, red valerian. Red valerian is really common around Lewis. You see it everywhere, but great, great species. But another species that is a little bit like Budlia, some people sort of consider it a slightly wasteland type plant, but it doesn't matter what other people think. Uh, okay, so this is a... This is probably one of the only, or one of the very few controversial topics in wildlife gardening, and that's should you use non-native species. Now, I'm not going to argue that a wildlife garden should only be native because there's just absolutely no evidence for it whatsoever. The non-native plants that you see, some of them attract more pollinators than any other native species. Now, in a non-urban environment, you might... Um, we prefer non-native species because we're targeting the, the specialist species like the Adonis blue who only target one host plant and they have evolved in tangent with that species. But in the urban environment you're not going to get all those very rare specialist species, you're going to get the generalist ones. So, and, and they don't really mind, as long as there's lots of pollen and nectar in a plant they really don't care where it's from. And a lot of the species, this is, um, this is wild marjoram, and it's a really, really nice looking plant, but it's, it's not native. Same as Balias, lavenders, um, pot marigold. They're not, they're not native species, and they're really, really excellent for pollinators. Um, in the, as part of my research, I didn't say it at the start, but my research includes doing lots of garden surveys and, um, in Lewis, and my, the, the garden with the, the plant with the highest number of pollinating insects visiting was an orange ball buddleia tree. It was a pretty large plant, but that's obviously a non-native, but it's really, really great for pollinators. Um, in the case of cultivated species, it's a little bit trickier. If you want to encourage, this is a sort of, this is a dahlia, sort of plant that would be visited by bees and butterflies. But if you're in the garden centre and you're going through dahlias, you'll most likely see lots of these. This is a double flower and you find this on a lot of cultivated species and those are ones to avoid because cultivated species, either through intense breeding, have lost, have lost their pollen, so they're sterile, and so there's nothing actually for the, for the pollinator to collect. They may still collect nectar from the plant, but quite often they are redundant for pollination. Um, alternatively, and this is the case for some uh, cultivated foxgloves, that the plant is so hybridised that the, the flower has, has changed shape and the pollen and nectar is actually th is there, but the pollinator can't get to it because the, the shape is so, is so changed. So I, I would avoid <coughs> species that, that you can tell have not evolved naturally. This is not a natural plant, very attractive, but. Um, it's the same as, um, I'm not going to be kind, but lots of British bedding plants, lots of British annual bedding plants um, are, you can see at the centre of the flower there's actually nothing there, it's an empty space. And this means that the, the reproductive, re, reproductive parts of the flower have either been um, modified into petals or they've just vanished over time. And these species again are redundant for pollinators. But this is a cultivated species of this, which is cranes built, this is geranium. Um, this is, the crane spills are the original geraniums and they are really, really attractive plants, had one of the highest pollinator counts from my survey and from surveys from other researchers before. Um, really, really lovely plants and ideal if you have a shady garden. Okay, um, so putting together all of the resources that I've mentioned here, um, I have 
my approach with wildlife gardening is sort of an offshoot of that, and that's habitat gardening. And that is to use the same methods as we would do in the agricultural or, or a nature reserve or a national park, whatever it happens to be, and apply that to the garden. So instead of just planting flowers, we plant something that will accommodate a pollinator for its entire life cycle, which includes grasses and it includes, and it includes other nesting resources. So it's, um, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples of these. So the first is um, the meadow habitat. If you have, um, it doesn't matter the size, if you have space in your garden, the, um, the person who's grown this wildflower meadow is, is particularly effective. She has sort of two wedge-shaped um, patches in her garden that are taken up by these gorgeous long grass lawns and she's just left them. She hasn't planted anything but this lady is particularly lucky because she's right on the edge of agricultural land. She's still in town but there's lots of seed dispersal over from other parts, from lots of sort of field margins so she's got probably quite a good um, a good dispersion of wildflowers into her, into her seed bank. Somewhere right in the middle of town, if you grew your grass long, you might just find it's a, one or two species of long grass and it doesn't look particularly effective, but you can supplement this with plug plants or sprinkle some wildflower seeds in. Um, but this is the sort of habitat that in your garden that is great for brown butterflies like the meadow brown or the ringlet, because you can plant it, because they, they love grasses, they'll use the grass, their caterpillars will feed on the grass. And you can supplement a wildflower meadow like this with species that are not quite, that you wouldn't normally see in a natural, say, chalk grassland. So the purpose here is to create a habitat in your garden that is not the same as a natural version of the habitat, but an altered artificial urban version of it which not only accommodates what you want in the garden, but also increases the spe species richness of that habitat. So you could plant clovers and, and knapweeds and, and yarrow, which is never seen in chalk grassland, but looks really attractive in the garden. Um, this, is one, this is one I like to do in, in a garden without wanting to get any produce. From any, of the, um, from any of the vegetables. I just have lots of, let everything go to flower which I appreciate won't, you won't probably do on your allotment. But at the end of the year, if you have an allotment, a lot of, a lot of plants that, that you haven't, either haven't noticed or maybe they, you, you, just, you didn't need to harvest them, they bolted and you get lots of really pretty flowers, which I think look quite attractive as a, as a unique garden feature. Um, and these are the sorts of air, uh, habitats that attract white butterflies, so your green vein white or your large or your small white. Um, and it, these are just lists of common host plants that you could have in a little habitat like this. Um, I mean this only needs, if you wanted this, this only needs to be a very small space in your garden, it doesn't need to be a, hu a huge stretch of it, but it's something a little bit unusual. Briefly about attracting moths, um, most adult moths don't have the mouth parts to, to feed because their intention is to breed and then they die. Um, but they do, they do sort of quench their, their thirst on, some, on or it's, uh, blackberry juice. That's why you quite often see people have um, left fruits out, left rotting fruits out, um, maybe from blackberries or whatever it happens to be, uh, for, the, for the moths to, to feed on. But they feed on other species as well. So um, uh, they, they'll feed on the nectar of ivy, red valerian and honeysuckle. And the caterpillars, the caterpillars love tree leaves, which is why you see so many insect-eating birds up in trees all the time, because they're probably feeding on a lot of these, a lot of these moth caterpillars. Um, but if you wanted to plant a single plant down in, down in, your, in your flower bed and see if you, you, see, if you see, any um, see any moth caterpillars, then bed straws, that's ladies' bed straw, but uh, common bed straw is normally white, very pretty, dainty flower. And if you wanted an elephant hawk moth in your garden, the only thing you need to do is plant swathes of um, rosemary willow herb, and then you'll get them. Okay, this, this sort of underlies everything I've talked about. The garden on the, the flower bed on the left has many, many different species in it, and this one on the right has two. Um, 
if a pollinator would be given the choice, it would choose this one because it's consistent. Um, the foraging, if, if, there was, if there were a few species in there that were really good for pollinators, but maybe these ones, I'm not sure what they are, but they're not good for pollinators, I mean, they wouldn't be used, then there's a lot more time invested. It's like us having to sort of search through a whole shop to find what we're looking for, as opposed to it all just being laid out in front of us, the exact thing we want. So if there's, if there's a plant that you see in your garden that really attracts pollinators, the very best thing to do is to plant more of it, to have loads of it. Now, I appreciate some people don't have gardens which can accommodate you know, stretches and stretches of plants like this, but it means if you have a small garden and you want to improve the number, if you want to increase the number of pollinators, the thing to do is... It is decide, decide what garden, what kind of garden you want, which is probably already quite clear in your mind, and just increase what you already have. If you have a really large garden, then you could potentially plant a, a vegetable flower habitat and a meadow habitat in another place, but have them ha have more than one. But if you have a small garden, then then just plant more of what you already have, and it's and it's really attractive seeing plants like that on mass. Um, finally, I know I haven't said very much about honeybees. That's purely because my area of research is focused on wild pollinators. And um, a few people from my um, garden surveys last year did ask me, or, or, or did say, oh, we were thinking of getting some honeybees. I've, I've never kept honeybees, and I don't know a huge amount about their maintenance and looking after them. Um, but I would say that imagine... Imagine a honeybee is like, is like a dog. It's great. It's, it's a pet that you can keep and you can look after it. But also, if you imagine that the, um, the British countryside is full of wolves, it means that there's lots of wild species which really need our help. Um, and, they're not get, and, and unlike honeybees, they're not getting it from anywhere else. They're relying on the plant choices that we, that we make. So to anybody who's, who's thinking about keeping honeybees, I would suggest have a look what's in your garden already or in your allotment. And although bees travel great distances, remember that ultimately all the pollinators in, in your green space are competing against each other for the resources. If you introduce a hive of honeybees, which number in the thousands, they, they will utilise all, the, all of the floral resource that they see around them. And a lot of the solitary bees and a lot of the bumblebees, which may have a nest of between 50 and a couple hundred individuals, they'll miss out on that opportunity. So if you have plenty of floral resource, then honeybees are a great idea. But if you have a small garden and are thinking of you just want some more pollinators, I would think about trying to attract more wild pollinators before going, going along the, sort of the domesticated route. Um, lots of people ask me for recommended list. These are my recommended lists. Um, so the, this one you might have seen as a starting guide with a good plant list. The um, RHS Perfect for Pollinators list is really good for pollen and nectar plants. It doesn't include host plants, so just be aware of that. And Plants of Bees is a new-ish book which is um, really, really excellent um, for, um, for, uh, for um, honeybees, solitary bees and bumblebees, so it will cover all of them. Uh, lastly, um, I had a few people in my garden surveys last year who volunteered their gardens who said that they would quite like to have some way of keeping up to date with the research and so I, I tried a couple of different things but I have set up a, a Facebook page which is anybody can, anybody can um, join and have a look and I will just post up pieces of research that I've come across that I think are interesting, news updates and any other sort of uh, identification sort of training um, opportunities that anybody would like to get involved in over the summer. So if you wanted to, you can have a look at that. I think I'm at the end. Um, oh yeah, and just lastly, lastly, your garden is for you. So, you know, put the wildlife as a sort of a second, um, a second peg in your, in your garden maintenance. Do your garden however you like it. Gardening is inherently wildlife friendly. So no matter what your garden looks like or how you maintain it, it's going to have lots of really good spaces for, for insects and all sorts of other species. And anything that you choose to do to improve it, do whatever you want to do. Do what you think looks nice, because there are many, many gardens. And if we all do something that looks nice and is good for pollinators, then, then they're going to make a, quite a big difference.